this week has, um, has been a, a little different uh, in that uh, where I thought I was going with the sermon ended up uh, going a totally another direction. But I want to try to connect some to dots to where we've been over the last few weeks as a part of that. During over the last few weeks, remember, we've talked a lot about the people of Israel. A part of uh, their being set free uh, from Egyptian rule and uh, finding safety from the Egyptian army and then coming into a, a kind of a wilderness area and complaining of no food and no water and no presence of God. However, in all of this, you and I know that God has provided for their every need. God has been present at times, but uh, they haven't recognized it. So we concluded uh, the sermon last week with saying, Emmanuel, which is God with us. And also that scripture from John's gospel at the end said, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So God is with us. Yet over the last couple of years, I've heard some things, and I've said it probably several times, and uh, as I looked a little bit deeper into this, I thought, uh, well, maybe that wasn't real smart of me, so I want to try to undo some of that for me, and maybe it can you. It's uh, the mantra of the world that says, whatever, you know it, have you heard that? Guys, you all have heard it, have you said it? Whatever. Whatever is a part of that. Well, what does whatever mean is a part of that? It says, uh, well, you know, it's kind of, you got to do the neck thing, and you got to do the eye thing, and the tone of voice, and part of what it says, do what you want. It's not like you're going to listen to me anyway, or if you do, what are the chances you'll understand what I'm saying? Uh, maybe on some Sunday mornings I say that, well, whatever, you know, uh, what's the chances? What's the chances of our understanding and being able to understand what God's Word says? Sometimes it's that whatever. Because of that whatever, there is a loss of hope and almost a careless attitude. I could care less. Well, there's a lot of whatevers, and that comes in a lot of shapes and forms. And I want to list a few for you, and uh, knowing who you are better than anyone else, I want to see if you can identify which one of these isms you may have. Okay? Are you ready? Here we go. Whatever happens is predestined, and nothing can be done about it. If that's you, that's fatalism. Whatever happens is God's plan, and I earned it, or I deserve it. That's determinism. Whatever happens is good and for the best because the universe is good is called optimism. Whatever happens is bad because the universe is evil, that's called pessimism. Whatever happens, happens because we live in an irrational world, that's called absurdism. And this one, whatever happens, just happens because things happen for no reason, and that's accidentalism. Lots of whatevers, just a few to think about. But what about God's whatever? God's whatever is uh, in the scriptures we read this morning is a part of that. Paul gives us the attributes for living a life of God's whatevers and a piece of God's own doing. Do you have that piece? You have it at times and not at other times in the midst of that? And you might ask the question which um, I ask of myself, well, what does Paul know about today so that we might have peace? Do you remember Paul's circumstances? Maybe it will shed a little bit light. Paul wasn't writing from a plush office uh, preparing a sermon with pie in the sky in mind. Paul was writing from where? Do you remember? He was writing from prison. He was writing from prison. He was there and every day of his prison life he was afraid it could be his last. But he found something. He found God's whatever. Paul uses six words in the midst of what we shared there in uh, that scripture reading. And I'll mention that. But I want to take you someplace else for a moment. I want to take you to a medieval monastery. Because there's a particular word that comes as a part of that. The monastery, most of you probably know that. It's where persons have dedicated themselves in pulling away from the world to focus upon the things of God. Now, sometimes, probably all of us would like to do that. Just 
get away from everything as a part of that and just be able to focus on God. And others can say, well, if we're supposed to share the goodness and the glory of God, then we need to be out among the people and sharing in the midst of that. But it's a, a place where it serves as an incubator for those who are seeking the holiness of God. Uh, there were multiple gardens in most of these monasteries, but one in particular was at the center of the monastery. It was called a garth, G-A-R-T-H. It was there, and it was protected by the walls of the cloister, and it took a lot to get in. And persons who would visit the monastery could not go in there. It was only for the monks. It was a place that they knew that they could go to withdraw away from the world and there find and know God better and find the peace of God. Do you have one of those places? Can you find a place where you can set aside everything else from the world and be in contact with God? Because that's a part of the ingredient. And I'm going to give you those six words in a second. But let me tell you about some places that are not a garth, okay? <laughs> one of these came up the other day and I had to go back and write it in. A garth is not a place of peace. When you are traveling, following a combine on Highway 138. And uh, you start following that about a half mile out of Calhoun and go almost halfway before the combine pulls over in a field. That's not really one of those things when I was thinking of getting home a little bit earlier. Maybe for some of you, those of you who continue in the work world, uh, is not a place for Garth or for peace. When there are tensions, there are deadlines, there's boredom, there's panic, and then also there's prickly personality. Maybe at your dining room table. Sometimes we might find that uh, there are flying peas at a dining room table. Sometimes uh, sniping siblings, sometimes grumpy teenagers, and uh, lo and behold, leftover lasagna. That's not always the most peaceful. But what about uh, the living room or the TV room? When you find that there are two computers, an iPod, a smartphone, and everybody is tuned out from one another. Those places of peace. But we long for those in our life. Paul offers us a road map. A road map that is very different maybe in our lives so that we can understand and find free freedom from anxiety, from worry, from doubt, filled with God's peace. How do we get there? Well, do you want to know what the words are? They're in Scripture. Maybe a little bit uh, different understanding, but they can be used in different ways. So I want, to, I want you to join in with me. I'm going to put a colon in between the two words. There is a preposition. I'm going to mention that in a minute. Anxious. I want you to repeat it. Anxious? Anxious. Nothing. <laughs> Prayerful? Everything. Everything. Thankful? Everything. Anything. Anything. Anxious? Nothing. Prayerful? Everything. Thankful? Anything. Now you could put one of two prepositions there and I'll have to admit I've probably been as guilty as anyone else of putting the wrong one there. The difference is in or for. Listen to how it sounds. Anxious in nothing. Prayerful in everything. Thankful in anything. What if you put the for? Anxious for nothing? Well, that kind of works. Prayerful for everything? Maybe that's sometimes where we are. We, we're, we're talking about all the things that we still want instead of prayerful for the things and thankful for the things that we've had, thankful for anything, whatever it might be. As we think about those, sometimes it's difficult to find those things as a part of our life. It's difficult in my life, but I'm going to try to, to do better and to be mindful to know that those six words, because I long for that peace of God, and I think you do, for that peace in your heart and your mind that as you go through life, that everything is there. But you can change them around in different orders. But for this morning, I want to say that uh, basically the foundation is thankfulness. It's the first step. And you can't go any further until you learn how to be thankful. Thankful in anything. Not thankful for anything. 
But in the midst of situations, whether difficult or whether hard or whether bad news or good news or whatever, we learn how to be thankful. Without thankfulness, again, there's no going forward. I remember one of my favorite songs. It was probably by one of the first contemporary uh, artists in contemporary music by a fellow by the name of Andre Crouch called My Tribute. How can I say thanks for all the things you've done for me, things so undeserved, yet you proved your love for me? The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I have and all that I will ever be, I owe to you. Do you have that kind of thankful heart? To be thankful in the mix of that and thank God through Jesus Christ that we have salvation. Gratitude is that first step toward peace. Peace that we can find. We realize, we realize, probably again today, that we owe a debt that we cannot pay. We owe a debt that we cannot pay. And yet in the midst of that, sometimes we let those little things kind of get in our way and we say, well, I didn't mean to do it. I'll make it up to you later or no one will notice. God in Jesus Christ died for the small things and the big things. Christ didn't distinguish between a part of that saying that he did not care. It wasn't the more or less of part of what we did. He went to the cross for all of those. For all of us to be reminded in our life, can we say, I am thankful for anything? The losing stock market, wow, what a week, a thousand points. All of those of us who had investments there remember what we lost in 2008 and we begin to think that we're about to recover a little bit and then, shoom, can you be thankful in that? Sure, we can be thankful and uh, give uh, great joy and find great joy in our children and our grandchildren is a part of that. We share in that. But can you be thankful for children who give you worry and pain on a regular basis? We give thanks for jobs, for families, for homes, for friends. But can you give thanks when you're rejected by someone? Be thankful in anything, whatever comes our way. The second part is, if we can be thankful in anything, it probably is because we have been prayerful in everything. If we can be thankful in anything, it's because we've made a connection through prayer and we put our trust in completely in God and sharing is a part of that. Sometimes uh, prayer would come, as uh, I heard someone say, you know, you have to be prayerful uh, if you get through a screaming boss at work, you have to be prayerful. All things by prayer and supplication, the scripture says, as a part of that. When we do that, or try believing in a hopeful future. Try believing in a hopeful future, and you can't do it without prayer. You can't believe that. It's a part of our experience in life. But the easiest part of that seems like the hardest. Anxious in nothing. Once thankfulness and prayerfulness have entered as a part of our life, we can find relief from the anxious moments, the anxieties and worries and cares that weighed us down as a part of our lives. It doesn't mean everything's going to work out perfect. Those of you who know a part of that peace in God doesn't mean that it's always, again, easy. It doesn't mean as a part of our life, but with the larger vision, of Christ before us, of his work in our life and prayer always available to us. It says pray without ceasing. Prayer is available anytime. You don't have to find a quiet place. You can say a, a, what's called a popcorn prayer, just something quickly as you drive down the road. Remember, it's uh, hazardous to your health if you try to pray with your eyes closed driving down the road. That doesn't work. But we can be prayerful prayerful and saying those words, saying those words that I said on Friday night and said again tomorrow this morning to say, Joshua will be in my prayers. Don't say it if you don't mean it. Be prayerful. 
Because there are others that you and I ask, and we ask them, and they say, I will be praying for you. If you've experienced the power of prayer, it changes, and you don't say those words lightly as a part of that, as God works in our life, but we share the larger vision again of Christ and prayer always available to us. Fear, doubt, despair, misery, dry up, and blow away. If we embrace thankfulness, and prayer, and if you live anxiety-free, not trouble-free, you and I both can find peace. Paul understood that. Do we? It's not just a whatever, unless it's God's whatever. He says, follow those instructions. Be careful in our understanding as we do that. Think upon those things that are pure and noble and holy and good. But we have some barriers. We have some barriers that we all face. I want to just name them for you. It's called hurry, worry, and slurry. Okay? Hurry. We're all in too big a hurry. We face those difficulties, and many times it's because we ignore some of the things that are most important in our life. Just a question to ignore. When you go out to a restaurant and eat, Usually uh, your waiter or waitress has a name tag. Do you call them by name? Or do you expect them to provide perfect service? Do you say thank you? Um, sometimes it just drives me up the wall, I'm going to confess. It doesn't happen too often, at least not in day's world. But I have been in restaurants at a time that if I took one sip of water or one sip of coffee, somebody was there to refill it. Now that can get a little bit too much. But no matter how many times it happens, we all need to say thank you. We find in the midst of our life that, again, we're sometimes in too big a hurry. The other part is the worry, and worry is the thing that says that we're inward turned. Seth's here this morning. He knows. You've heard me share this before. Max Lakato's book, uh, is valuable. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. It's still out there. And it's called, It's Not About You. And yet, worry is always, many times, inward turn. How does it affect us? But what about those things that are affecting other people? Do we reach out and show them love and kindness and grace? And then the other is the slurry. And the slurry is uh, all of the stuff that clogs our vision of what God wants us to be and of what God sees for us, but we clog it with so many other things that we can't see God's vision clearly. So therefore, we live without peace and we live without His joy. Ran across uh, an old hymn. Uh, Tracy, it was too late to get you to sing it. It goes back to uh, 1891. Uh, which was found and was a part of a song by the Swedish Salvation Army. It was translated in English in 19 and 10. And I want you to just hear these words. Thanks to God for my Redeemer. Thanks for all thou dost provide. Thanks for times not but a memory. Thanks for Jesus by my side. Thanks for pleasant, balmy springtime. Thanks for dark and dreary fall. Thanks for tears by now forgotten Thanks for peace within my soul. Thanks for prayers that thou hast answered. Thanks for those which were denied. Thanks for storms that I have weathered. Thanks for all you do supply. Thanks for pain. Thanks for pleasure. Thanks for comfort in despair. Thanks for grace that none can measure. Thanks for love beyond compare. Thanks for roses by the wayside. Thanks for thorns their stems contain. Thanks for home and thanks for fireside. Thanks for hope, the sweet refrain. Thanks for joy and thanks for sorrow. Thanks for heavenly peace with thee. Thanks for hope in the tomorrow. Thanks through all eternity. To find peace, we find those words again. Anxious in nothing. Prayerful in everything. And thankful for anything. God's whatever for us is peace. Peace that passes all understanding. 
peace again that guards and keeps our heart. I just wonder if the people of Israel had understood a part of that, is that God was their peace. That they would have worried about all those things, the anxious moments and the things that you and I worry and think about as a part of our life. But to find that peace, six words, six words, if we'll just meditate on those. First, to be thankful. Second, to be prayerful. Third, to see anxiety and worry and cares pass away. God wants for us that peace, and when we find God's peace, we also find great joy. When we find God's peace, we find great joy. The choir had a little trouble the other night uh, when we made the decision, and I told Tracy we were going to sing this song, and some of them said, well, that's a Christmas song. No, it's a song for all times. We're going to sing joy to the world this morning. I started to tell Tracy and I went back and looked at the words from my earlier days because the first concert I ever attended was by a group called Three Dog Night and they sang Joy to the World. And then I went back and looked at the lyrics and I said, you know, that's not a church song. So we're going to sing Joy to the World. And I want you to sing it to you, even if you only have a part of that peace. But to know that God wants to give us complete peace. And in giving us peace, he gives us great joy. And then the next thing you can do is this morning, notify your face if you have that peace and that joy with a smile because you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that God is with you always. Come, let's sing. You'll know the first verse by heart, right? But some of the verses, the other verses have... Uh, uh, great, uh, great words that we need to share and sing. I invite you to stand as the praise team comes and, and leads us as we sing joy to the world. <laughs> 